Oh, if you took my other fin. Don't look at me. Come on, guys. We're in big trouble without that other fin. <laughs> we can't go to the rocket meet without all our fins. No, no. There it goes. <laughs> right, who's got the glue? I've got it. Here. Oh, come on. Hey, where's the engine? Thank you. It's in the box, I think. Ah. You know, I don't know why they call this an engine. I mean, what's inside it? Solid fuel. And it has a little igniter. That's this. And it goes right here. And the igniter sets it off? Yeah. It ignites the fuel. Oh. So the fuel, or the gases from the fuel, come out here? Mm hmm So if they go this way, the rocket goes this way. Right. Ah. OK, done. Now all we have to do is wait for the glue to set. Do you think the glue will dry in time for the rocket meet tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Mine's done, too. Yeah? What do you think? Well, Paco, um, it's great. I've never seen anything like it. Will it fly? Sure. Well, where's the engine? In one of these cups? No, I built a little platform for it. See? It works the same way yours does. Wow. I've never seen anything like it. What do you call it? The PX-124B. Oh, that's easy to remember. It stands for Paco Experimental. 124 is my birthday, January 24th, and B stands for basement, because that's where I built it. Oh, right. So I bet it's going to be the only one like it at the meet tomorrow. I've never seen anything like it. Astronaut Joe Allen is riding in a chair that floats on air. It's used to simulate the weightlessness of space. Robin and I wanted to find out how the chair worked. Instead of wheels, it has three pads like this attached to the chair legs. A technician turns on the air and it flows through a long hose right into the pads and makes a very, very thin cushion of air between the chair and the floor. The chair actually floats on this thin cushion of air. The floor is made of steel. Joe let me try out the chair. It really was just like floating. There. Are you gonna stay like this or when, when does it now, stop? Now, now, do you feel weightless? No, I don't feel no. weightless. You feel the same, but you can move back and forth as though you were in the weightlessness of space. There's some interesting scientific principles that we can also demonstrate with the chair that have a lot to do with space flight. Put your hands up like this. I'm just going to push on you very gently. Don't be afraid. I'm ready. <laughs> wow. So when am I going to stop? Never. Well, actually, when you hit the other side, or let me move around. Hold up your hand. Come. There. So you just stopped me with the same amount of force as you pushed me. Right. But wait a minute. You just pushed him just a little tiny bit, and he right. just kept moving. And you right. stopped him just very lightly. Because friction did not stop him in the meantime. In a normal chair with wheels, he would have rolled a little bit and then stopped because of the friction. In other words, if, if you pushed me, I would have continued to move forever until something else chose to stop right. me with the same amount of force. Exactly. Pushing back. Exactly. Yeah. But in space, you could go on and on and on really forever in that same direction unless something stops you. Unless something stops you. That's yes. kind of scary yeah. to think about. Now, here we go. There. <laughs> In space, something in motion will stay in motion unless stopped by an outside force. Now, 
Have you ever heard about for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction? Mm -hmm. yeah. You sure? Yeah. yeah, but can you demonstrate that you here? You can demonstrate it right here. And to do that, though, we need something for you to throw like a heavy medicine ball. And I oh, just okay. happen to have one. What we're going to demonstrate is you throwing the ball to me, and it, the ball should go in one direction, and you should go in the other direction. I hope it works. Let's see. Okay. Oh. Now we'll start, you want to start very motionless. Okay. And after you throw it once, I'm going to give it back and you can throw it again. Okay. All right? All right. Okay, wait. Tell me when. Okay, now you're motionless. You ready? Mm hmm Okay, throw it hard. Are you moving? Yes. All right, now I'm, I'm going to throw it to you. Okay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> throw it this again. This is neat. Okay. Throw it hard. You are moving. Um, excuse me, no, <laughs> okay. All right, now, that's a, that's a, not only an interesting scientific principle, mm -hmm. but it's exactly like that, that we get into space, because that's the way a rocket works. There are a lot of, of molecules and atoms of gases that come out through the rocket engines at a very high rate of speed, and this causes it to go in the opposite direction. So when I threw the ball away, we moved in opposite directions. The ball went forward and I went backwards. That's exactly right. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right. The ball went one direction and you went the other, the other direction. If you throw a medicine ball in space, the ball would go one way and you would go the other because the ball pushes back on you with the same force as you push on the ball. If you threw a lot of medicine balls one after the other, you'd go faster and faster in the opposite direction. This is how a rocket works. Except, instead of throwing medicine balls, the rocket throws out tiny molecules of exploding gases. The rocket goes in one direction, the molecules in the other. Win anything? <laughs> I hope so. It's a lot of As long as it flies, right? Okay, let's tie it onto the rubber band. T minus five, four, three, two, one, ignition. All right, I'm pretty sure the igniter's stuck inside the engine. Okay, I got the parachute loaded. All right, make sure the engine's sticking out just a little bit. Right. Well, I'll stick it out a little bit. Yeah. It didn't burn the model. Ready? Yep. There she is. All oh, right. That's nice. Let's go get her checked out. Okay. It better fly. It'll sure. fly. Absolutely. I hope Paco's flies. <laughs>
My name is Franklin Ramon Chan Diaz. I always thought that there was a, a basic compatibility between being an astronaut and being a scientist and engineer. To become an astronaut, there's no real clear-cut formula. The mission specialists to whom I belong are people from all different backgrounds. We have physicists and engineers and medical doctors and, and biologists and, and so on. There it is, it's a left RCS, I got my master alarm. So the left reaction control system okay. is uh, having troubles. Uh, so I'm gonna call the system summary on the CRT. You do not have to be a pilot to become an astronaut. Although it turns out that everybody who is an astronaut loves to fly. I, for one, always love to fly, and I always try to find uh, a way to do it. I was born in uh, San Jose, Costa Rica in 1950. Two years later, I moved with my mother to Venezuela. When I first got interested in space, it was uh, 1957 when uh, Sputnik was launched. I remember my mom told me that I could actually climb on, on the mango tree in the backyard of my house and uh, look for it. I never saw the Sputnik, but me and my friends so many things that uh, perhaps were more important than just a glimpse of the satellite. We saw uh, things that weren't there, such as ships from outer space, and uh, we could see ourselves flying in that direction one day. And uh, in fact, we started building our own uh, little spaceship. We would lift off and go to some faraway planet and explore, and then uh, come back home in time for supper. This is the back of the Saturn V rocket that took uh, three people all the way to the moon. It has real big engines, and this is one of them. This engine here puts out about one and a half million pounds of thrust. The fuel comes out of those tiny holes that can be seen over at the end, and the fuel is liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen that come out and mix and burn, and when they burn, they produce a very hot exhaust, as hot as 5,000 degrees, and it all goes out this way, and the rocket goes the other way. And it took five of these engines to get this ship off the ground and only 41 miles up in the sky. To feed all five of these engines, we need 15 tons of propellants per second. The way we usually go up into space is in stages. As we go up, we burn fuel, we have all this dead weight, which is the empty tank, so we cast it away. When the second stage is used up, we cast that one away also, and we have the third stage, and once that one is burnt up, the rest of the ship is now coasting en route to the moon at 30,000 miles an hour. We can't go any faster. We're stuck at that speed which is okay if you're just gonna go to the moon. But if you wanted to go to a distant planet, why it would take you 10 months to get there at that speed? What we need is an engine that can get you there faster, not at 30,000 miles an hour, but at 300,000 miles an hour. That engine is a plasma engine. With an engine like that, we could go to Mars, not in 10 months, but maybe one month. Here are the walls of the container, and, uh, and these little squares here are the magnets. When I was very young, I used to draw uh, rocket ships and starship. Whenever I come up with ideas, I first perceive them as an actual picture. To me, it's very important to be able to draw the idea that a person is trying to convey. Right now, I am working in the development of this plasma rocket. Plasma is a, uh, is a fourth state of matter. That's how one defines it. Uh, if you think of a, of a chunk of ice as being the solid state, here's a chunk of ice, solid state, we call that the first state. Uh, if you add heat to the ice, you get the second state, which is the liquid. 
If you add more heat to the liquid, you get the third state, which is a gas. And uh, the gas, uh, uh, if you take that gas and you add even more heat to it, then you get the fourth state, which is the plasma. Um, the sun, for example, is, uh, is plasma. Uh, some of the material between the stars is in the plasma state. If we just go out, stay in space for a while, all we would see is just plasma. In fact, uh, plasma is about the most common state of matter in the whole universe. I have one thing that I do uh, see myself as, and that, that is a, as a dreamer. I've always uh, been in a condition or in a, in a, a situation where I am looking for something, or I am trying to follow uh, a dream. I come from a family of adventurers, and I think adventure is a very uh, powerful driving force in which motivates me to do things. Everybody is good at something. Once a child discovers what uh, he or she is good at, that child will take off on his own to follow his or her path. I was lucky to um, have a set of parents that allow me to do that. like me train for a simulated shuttle mission. Space Camp, day two. We rehearse for our big mission in the Space Shuttle Simulator. You might have to push one of these sequences. Now, if it says to do something with the oxygen systems... Our team leader, Brad, shows us how to work the controls in the cockpit. Of us will be the shuttle crew, and the other half will be mission control. Brad's showing them how to monitor the flight. Okay. Don't lose us, guys. I don't think there are any Martians out in space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is not funny. I wouldn't know. Okay, one, two, three, go. One, two, three, four, five. The rehearsal was great, but I want to get down to business. Shuttle astronauts have to know how to work in weightlessness. We're using a floating chair to make us feel weightless. When Rebecca pushes against the panel, she goes the opposite way. I tried to tell her. You're an astronaut! He's <laughs> dreaming, you're dreaming, you're floating. Hi, right, you ready to put the helmet on? There you go. Now, what do you think of the seat? I think they should make one in a kid's size. <laughs> At the end of the day, all the kids in space camp get together to meet two real astronauts, Wally Shira and Don Isley. We had a few things to tell them. How long will it be before a kid like me can go up in space? If you, if you have the intelligence and know how to do a task very well, you weigh so much less that it's easy to use your brain and not have as big a body to take into space. So I, I would say someday you'll find this will be a, a very, very, very likely chance. I don't see any reason why you couldn't go right now at your age. There's no particular minimum age limit that no. I know of. It takes a lot of training, a yeah. lot of time. You guys are lucky here. You get to make a flight after only four days. <laughs> Tomorrow, day three, Erica and I build an antenna, and I take a ride in the manned maneuvering unit. Whenever there's trouble, we're there on the double, we're the bloodhound gang. If you've got the crime, we've got the time, we're the bloodhound gang. A man with amnesia hires the gang to find out who he is. There's someone missing. Who? 
me. All he remembers is an eclipse of the moon, and all he has with him is a cassette that plays radio static. He calls himself Kepler, but he doesn't know why, and he's being followed. Let me leave first. I want to get a picture of that man that's following you. He looks familiar. Be my guest. You're staying at the Simpson Hotel, right? We'll get in touch with you the moment we have anything. Good luck. I'll need it, won't I? Let's play the tape. Right. May 6, 2300 hours. Mr. Kepler's voice. Ed, th there's a cricket in here. It'll ruin the tape. Uh... I read somewhere that you can tell what the temperature is by how many times a cricket chirps. Shh. like a snowy tree cricket. Are we on target, Ed? Okay, now let's see what we got. <laughs> oh, hi, Ricardo. Hi, Candy. Who's your friend? Oh, this is Jeff. Hi, J-E-F-F. -F? Hey, uh, you want a case? Uh-huh. You see that big guy across the street? Oh, yeah. You think Jeff could read us lips from here? He says, sure. Mm, he can't make out a word. He's speaking a foreign language. Why would anyone record radio static? Maybe it's a coded message. You think Mr. Kepler could be a spy? A spy who's lost his memory? On the other hand, it could be just radio static. Let me hook it up to the computer so he can see what those sounds look like. Get anything? An earful of noise. How about you? That big guy's not alone. He was talking to someone in a foreign language. You think he could be a foreign agent? Funny you should ask. Well, I've got film to develop. All set. Six, 2300 hours. That was about the day of the eclipse. Ed, we'll check it uh, out. Th there's a cricket in here. It'll ruin the tape. Hey, I got something. Remember, he says it's a snowy tree cricket? Maybe it's a local species. Him. We can yeah, almost like pinpoint where Mr. Kepler cricket. came from. I'll call the head? Natural History Museum oh, and see if I can see speak to got. an entomologist. <laughs> just static. Makes kind of a pattern. Could be a signal. Well, thanks anyway. Wouldn't you know, the snowy tree is found almost everywhere in the U.S. We're back to square one. You were right, Skip. Some crickets do tell the temperature, and the snowy tree is one of them. You count the number of chirps in 15 seconds and add 40. I'll rewind the tape. Go get a stopwatch. But I don't know how knowing the temperature is going to tell us who Mr. Kepler really is. A clue is a clue, isn't it? Start. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, what eight, are you doing? nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine. Stop. Fifteen seconds. Add 40. The temperature when Mr. Kepler made this was 69 degrees. Big deal. Look at this. 69 degrees on May 6th at night. Well, that's right. 2,300 hours. That's military talk for 11 o'clock. Pretty warm night for this time of the year. Florida, maybe? Or Texas, Arizona, someplace like that? It would be easier to find a needle in a haystack. Skip, you better run down and get a copy of that tape, uh, just in case... This gentleman gets wise to us. Okay, I'm gonna put them as close to the back. Be very careful, don't touch both of them together. Okay, that's why I turned them out. Each one Heads up down by the van, the truck. Careful. That's just a scream it out. Okay, let her know we're ready. Okay, we're ready to launch on number eight. <laughs> On head eight, she 
minus five, four, three, two, two one, one, contact. contact. On pad eight, we have continuity. T minus five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Children's Television Workshop.